So for the next uh, two Sundays, um, we're going to be taking a break from my series in the book of Judges uh, to focus in on um, the Passover season, Easter, um, and, and today, of course, Palm Sunday. So uh, we're going to be talking about the different events that uh, led up to the crucifixion and the glorification of Jesus as he became the Savior of humanity and took his seat at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Amen. Let's, uh, let's bow in a word of prayer this morning as we ask God's blessing upon his word today. Jesus, we thank you for your, your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you came to earth to save us. Lord, what, a, what an honor and a privilege it is for us to be able to, to have a fellowship with you. And uh, Father, that you've taken care of, of our burdens and uh, you carry your bur- our burdens on your shoulders and you've saved us from our sins. God, we're just so grateful. So as we get into study about uh, Palm Sunday today, God, we just pray that you would, um, you would bless this, this word and that people would learn and, and they'd be able to take something home that they could apply to their lives, that it would encourage them and strengthen them in their, in their walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today, March the 24th, 2024, we call it Palm Sunday. And um, one week before Jesus died on the cross, at the time of the Jewish Passover, that's a feast that was held, Um, we'll get into more of that, Jesus entered uh, the city of Jerusalem with many people celebrating his entry. And and the circumstances were were, uh, that the Lord actually had just... um, recently when he just before he walked into Jerusalem he had raised Lazarus from the dead um, and and that was in a town called Bethany which is about two kilometers or three I guess just over three kilometers outside of Jerusalem and uh, the people were uh, stirred I guess that's the easiest way to to say it the people were stirred up they uh, this amazing miracle to see a man that had been in the tomb for four days, Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came out in his grave clothes. And they unwrapped him. And nevertheless, this miracle created a huge stir. And um, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, you'd think everybody would be like, wow, God, this is awesome. This is awesome. But after Lazarus was raised from the dead, um, the Jewish high priest Caiaphas and the Pharisees and Sadducees and other teachers of the law, they uh, were very concerned with what would happen um, to their world politically. And they were thinking about themselves and thinking about what was established and their position in it. They, They were very concerned with what would happen to their world politically if Jesus was to continue doing miracles like what they had heard about him doing with Lazarus. Now, we read of their concerns in the book of John, chapter 11, um, 47 to 48, which state, it states this, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What were we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So, subsequent to that, in, verse, in the verses after this, the, the Sanhedrin looks for ways that they could trap Jesus and, and get him to be put to death. They wanted him out of the picture. So that's kind of the backdrop to what was going on behind the scenes. All the people were stirred up and, and, and like, wow, this is so amazing. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and, 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 and the leadership in the Jewish religious community was like, we got to get rid of this guy or else something's going to happen and we're going to lose our positions and, and, and he's going to upset the, the apple cart, I guess you might say. So, Turning to Luke, this is where we come to Palm Sunday. So Luke chapter 19, reading from verses 29 
um, to 38. As he per- approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent ahead and went and found it, just as he had told them, as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks out on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to, to the Mount of, down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So that's what Luke had to say concerning the matter. Pastor Jonathan read some of what John had to say. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told even more specifics about this event. The Apostle Matthew's account says this, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And further to that, just a snippet of John, in John 12, 13, they took branches, palm branches, specifically, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. So in all four gospel accounts, we have, I, I think I said John, Pastor Jonathan actually read Mark. So in all, all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have this scene that unfolds as Jesus comes from that time where he, he raised Lazarus from the dead and he comes into the city and there's this great entourage of people and, and they're praising God and they're saying, glory to the king of Israel and Hosanna, Hosanna. That's what they're saying. So as Jesus rose as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, he was fulfilling two very specific Old Testament prophecies that were written four or five hundred years prior to this event. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, there is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, and this is how the coming Messiah would arrive. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth quite the prophecy. When you read about what happened on Palm Sunday, that was the fulfillment. And further to that, there's another prophecy in Psalms where the King David wrote this in Psalm 118, 25 and 26. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So these two prophetic utterances were directly fulfilled in Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now, Jesus did not do what a great conquering king would normally do. Rather than charging into Jerusalem with a sword drawn on a, on a great stallion, a white stallion, with, with his sword swinging through the air with a battle cry, which, by the way, Jesus will do one day, But not on this day. Jesus saw the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Zechariah unfolding. And he he was the orchestrator of this. 
Remember in the first book of John, the very first chapter of John, the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing made that has been made. In Him was life, and His life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not understand it. That living Word was referenced to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the living word of God shown for all mankind to see. And here he was orchestrating the events. And here he was riding into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. They were joyfully praising the Lord that day because they believed in him, having seen all of the miraculous signs that he had shown to them. And that's what it tells us. And this is the culminating in Lazarus. Don't forget about that. So this, this is a big deal. And the people shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. See, many in the crowd that day who would have studied would have understood or would have twigged on the fact that there was a prophecy that their Messiah was to come to them riding on a donkey's colt. So they waved out the palm branches, a national symbol for Israel, in hope and anticipation that Jesus would come and that Jesus would rescue them and save them from the tyranny of Rome. So they were hoping and, and, and praising the Lord as he came in, hoping that their Roman oppressors would be cast aside and that a messianic kingdom of peace would come into being. And they had it in their mind what this might look like. So they shouted, Ho Hoshena, Hoshena. And we say Hosanna in English. And Hosanna means save now. So they're, as, the, as, the, as, the, as Jesus was riding into the, the, the city, they were laying down these cloaks on the path and the palm branches on the path and they were saying save now Lord save now save now that's what Hosanna was blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord but the religious leaders that were there those guys that had plotted in behind the scenes to make sure that Jesus never gained any momentum were looking for a way to try and snuff this out they were not pleased. They were not happy to see the people praising God and calling Jesus the king. No, this Jesus was not at all like the king that they wanted him to be. In their minds, the king that they wanted was a king that would work with them and build his kingdom with them as the heads. And rather than praising them and calling them good leaders of the people, this Jesus of Nazareth dared to rise up against them and call them a brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs filled with dead man's bones because they had a form of godliness on the outside, but their hearts were far from the Lord. So they hated him, and they wanted to bring him down. Jesus didn't support them in their interests and in promoting their interests. <sighs> well, they wanted to be partners with the Messiah as he established his military rule over the earth. What they were looking for was prestige and power. And those who are proud, the Lord our God humbles. So Luke continues, and this is where we see this, in Luke 19, 39 to 44, or 39 to 40, I should say. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So, you see, Jesus wasn't just an ordinary man riding in on a donkey. Jesus was the one who knew what he was going to do to save people from the very beginning of time. He was coming to establish a kingdom 
that would be everlasting. It was a kingdom that was not of this world. He was coming to fulfill the law of Moses and to establish a new covenant. He would establish the spiritual kingdom in the hearts of the people where God would be at one with them. And significantly, when we see this, as they cried out, they also said this, peace in heaven rather than peace on earth. There could be no peace on earth because the prince of peace had been rejected and he would soon be slain. There would be peace in heaven as a result of the soon coming crucifixion of Jesus on Calvary and his resurrection from the dead. Those Pharisees, they're indignant, they're jealous. They wanted to stop the followers from singing praises to the Lord. And Jesus was like, you guys, you can't stop this. This, this has been planned from the beginning of time. And there's nothing that's going to stop this. If they were to stop praising me, the rocks themselves would cry out because what he's saying is I am. The rocks and everything in this world belongs to me, was created for me and by me for my purposes, so you're not going to stop this. Even the rocks would cry out if the people stopped crying out. You see, what many people, including the Pharisees, watching Jesus enter Jerusalem on that day missed. And what I think a majority of Christians today do not understand or realize is that on this particular day when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people in Israel, you know what they were doing? They were choosing a lamb. They were choosing a lamb for sacrifice, to be their Passover sacrificed lamb on the coming celebration according to the law of Moses. And you can see that, that whole story in Exodus chapter 12 and the law that Moses had there and asked the people to follow. This is hugely significant, and I'd like to explain it, and maybe you've never heard this before. Now, as all of us are aware, we have a calendar that we follow. And today, what's today? March, March 24th, right? March 24th, 2024. The calendar we follow is the Gregorian calendar, which relative to the world history um, is actually fairly recent. Our modern calendar has only been in effect since 8, 1582. So, consi considering the entire world history, very short time that we're... So, so, what did they do before that? Well, before our modern calendar, there were different ancient calendars in the world. And um, one ancient calendar was the Israelite calendar. And for, for those of you who don't know, they, they looked at things differently. For our day, okay, today, it started at midnight, right? We, we were sleeping when the new day started at midnight. New day would start, and as the sun goes down, it goes from midnight to midnight. Well, on the ancient Israelite calendar, each day would not start at midnight. A new day starts as the sun goes down. And the ne next day, when the sun goes down again, that would be the end of the day. So when you hear days being mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about from sundown to sundown, that period of time in between. That's the day, not from midnight to midnight. I need you to follow me here. Because today, Palm Sunday, March 24th, is a very important day. You see, today we commemorate the 10th day of the first month on the Israelite calendar called the month of Nisan. Not the car, okay? <laughs> 
Nisan is the first month on the Jewish calendar. And we are commemorating today on our March the 24th, okay, we're commemorating the 10th day of the month of Nisan. So on the 10th day of the month of Nisan, okay, each family was to pick a lamb without any blemish, no defect could be found on it, the people were called, the people of Israel were called to bring that lamb into their home and to care for that lamb for five days. And then on the evening of the 14th day of Nisan, they are to slaughter the Passover lamb just before sundown at the end of the day. And they were to take the blood of that lamb and apply the blood to the doorframe of their houses on the outside of the doorframe, the threshold where people would enter and exit the house. And during the night, on the 15th day of Nisan, after the day was done in the evening, the death angel went through Egypt and claimed the firstborn of every household, except for the homes that had the blood of the sacrificed lamb applied over the doorposts and over the, the doorframe. And when the death angel came to that house on that night on the first Passover, the wrath of God would see the lamb's blood over the doorframe to that house and would accept it as a sacrifice. And the death angel would pass over that home and the people within that household would be spared from the death that would come from the wrath of God. So the first day of Passover in Jewish custom has been Judaism, Judaism's transformant, transformative, I guess you could call it, event since uh, that happened the very first night when the Lord delivered the people of Israel from slavery and death through the blood of the Passover lamb. Are you starting to catch it? The importance of Palm Sunday? You see, when we look into the New Testament account, just before Jesus started his earthly ministry, you recall, when Jesus started his earthly ministry, he came down to the River Jordan where John the baptized, Baptist was baptizing people with a baptism of repentance, preparing them. He says, I'm a voice calling in, oh, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. And when the Lord Jesus was coming down towards John in that river, John pointed to the Lord and he was, revealed, he was given the revelation from God who this was that was coming towards him. And what did he say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So fast forward, we come to Jesus now entering Jerusalem. While all the Jews were preparing for the Passover, they failed to understand that the entry of Jeru Jesus in Jerusalem was occurring on the 10th day of Nisan. In fact, they didn't realize that they were actually selecting Jesus at that time as God's spotless, unblemished Passover lamb who would die in their stead, whose blood would be applied to the doorposts of the hearts of everyone who obeyed the Lord in following the Passover lamb and what God said to do with the blood of Jesus. We sing that song. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. People outside of our, of our congregation don't understand the significance of the blood. Well, the blood is representing life. And because of sin, all of us are condemned to death. There is no one righteous, not even one. We can say that we are good enough to make it and God would probably let us in because we're doing good, this good and that good and our good outweighs the bad. But the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one under, under heaven who is righteous enough to save themselves from their sins because the penalty of sin is death. Death comes from sin. But God in his mercy loved us so much that he sent us Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, 
sinless, pure, spotless, the Lamb of God. And he did so to take away the sin of mankind. Whoever would place their trust in him, their sins would be forgiven. And the death angel would pass over that person. And they would be given life in exchange for death. Because died, God died instead of us. And the beautiful thing is, not only is the sacrifice God, but the overseer of the whole project is God. You see, Jesus Christ is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. You can turn to a statue, you can turn to an idol, you can have some mystical, spiritual experience, but that experience is not going to save you. The only thing that can save you this day, my friend, is Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross for you. And that is the truth that will set you free if you believe. If you will believe. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says this, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, Jesus had indeed come to save the Jews on Palm Sunday, just not in the way that they thought he would. They were expecting a great champion to physically overthrow the government and to control things. But he he had come as a suffering servant to strike a blow to the core of what truly held the world captive. The captivity and the slavery of humanity that Jesus came to overthrow was the slavery of sin. The crowds were looking for a Messiah who would rescue them politically and free them nationally. But Jesus had come to to save them spiritually. First things first. Mankind's primary need is spiritual. It is not political, cultural, or national. It is spiritual. You see, even though the Jewish people correctly identified Jesus as their Messiah and the King coming in, they didn't, a lot of them, a lot of them didn't understand his overarching purpose. They didn't understand what he was up to. The crowd understood he was the Messiah. But they didn't understand the way that his kingdom would come in and that he was after the hearts. He was there to deal with the problem that causes all the other problems. The problem with us and with our world out there. Yeah, we got lousy governments. Yeah, we got people that are doing their own thing and you know, they're selfish, and the root of all that is sin. It's the fallen nature of man from Adam. Jesus came as the second Adam to deal a blow to that, a death blow to that. And when Jesus walked, after they laid the palm branches down, we were told he was walking towards the gates of Jerusalem, and he knew what was about to happen. He looked and he understood. In Luke 19, 41 to 44, we read this. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Oh, people. Jesus saw Jerusalem and he wept because he knew that they were going to reject him. Even though he understood that he was going to be their Passover sacrifice, he knew that they weren't going to get it. At least, not all of them. But for as many as would receive him, to them gave he the power to be the sons of God. You see, the Lord was looking at what he was doing here. And he was looking all the way through history at all of the people. 
And he knew that some, some would recognize him. And some would open their hearts to accept the sacrificial work that he had done for them. And it was all worth it. You see, the suffering of Christ, we're going to talk about it on Friday, was all worth it. Why? Because God saw the end result and it is love. He desired to have people be at one with him. And he saw all the way through history to you sitting in your chair right here because you're part of this. And you're part of the reason why Jesus did what he did. You're part of the reason why Jesus went in on the donkey in fulfillment of that prophecy. You are part of why he did what he did. Because he was going to be the Passover lamb, not only for the Jews of that day and the apostles in the early church, but for all who were afar off from many nations. You see, God's not pleased when people are visited by him and they choose not to acknowledge him or to ignore his invitation. He's moved to sorrow by it, actually. When the word of his gospel is given as a gift, pointing people towards peace, and instead they choose to follow their own wicked hearts to destruction as they want to make themselves their own God and and follow their own destiny according to the way they see fit. Oh, man. Like the destruction that would come to the Jews who rejected Jesus in AD 70. The Lord's heart is stirred to sorrow when he sees the masses of humanity passing and pushing away from his gift of salvation because they have not recognized the visitation of their God. They have not recognized him. They have not seen Jesus as the sacrificial lamb that he was. But through God's providence, despite the ignorance of what took place on that day with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law and the people that were welcoming him and thinking that he was going to be the great military man that was going to overthrow Rome and make their lives easier right then and there. That's what they were thinking, some of them. Despite their ignorance of what was actually taking place, God served his purposes anyways. You see, that's why the stones would cry out. These purposes were established by God, and they're unmovable. You can't move them. Jesus died once and for all to save people from their sins. There's nothing that's going to change that. He has done the work. He has made the entry into Jerusalem. He has become the Passover lamb, and he was sacrificed for our sake. There's nothing that's ever going to change that. So guess what? This is truth. And you can rest and rely upon it. You can stand firm upon it knowing that he who started a good work will carry it on into completion. And what's God's purpose? His God's purpose is God's purpose is to save you. To save you. Hosanna, save us. Well, guess what? He did. His salvation's extended to you. And if you had an encounter with the Lord and you've surrendered your life to him and you become a follower of Jesus Christ, the promises in the word of God for your future are fixed and true and there is nothing in this world that's going to shake that or take it away. That's why you can go anywhere and go through any kind of trouble and be confident that the Lord will never leave you, will never forsake you, he'll be with you to the very end of the age and he will take you into his arms at the end. And there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Nor there's no angels, no demons, nothing in the earth, nothing under the earth that can separate you from his love. The love that drove him to the cross. Being in very nature God. Philippians chapter 2 says this. You see, one day, every single knee will bow And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, 6, who being very nature God, Jesus, this is talking about Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and be found, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Isn't that awesome? See, one day every knee will bow, including mine, including yours. The worship will be real and the blinders will be off. The Apostle John records a scene in heaven that's going to be played out. He was given a, a glimpse into what's going to happen. In, G, in the Revelation chapter 7, Starting with verse 9, John says this, he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Lamb, see that? They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. Sound familiar? And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne. And the revelation of what Jesus was up to is now clear because they said salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Wow. And all the angels were standing around the throne and all the elder, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders asked, Ask me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out from the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down upon them or any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. This is the history that is to come for those who are the servants of Christ. Would you pray with me? Jonathan, would you come? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for Palm Sunday, the 10th day of Nisan. God, you were selected as the sacrificial Passover lamb. And Lord, we recognize that and we commemorate that today. We recognize that this was done. It was done for you, for you, for us, Lord, for me and for the other people that are here today and for everyone out there who believes. Lord, this was done for us. And we thank you for being our Passover sacrifice, Jesus. And this week, Going forward, I pray that this would be on our hearts and on our minds and we would think about that and think about what you did in paying the price so that we could be brought into fellowship with you, Lord. Father, maybe there's people here today who have never surrendered their lives to you. Jesus, I just pray that they would do that today. If you're here today and you're listening to this and you've never made that, taken that step of faith, you can. The Bible says, believe in your heart in Jesus, that Jesus is God's sacrifice for your sins. And ask him to forgive you, repent of your sins, believe in him, and confess him with your mouth. And if you do that, you will be saved. When you do that, God takes your sins, and your sins are paid for. And the death angel, when it comes, will pass over you, and you will be given life in exchange for the wrath of God because the wrath of God was poured out upon the Lamb.
So if you're here today and you want to talk to somebody afterwards, I'll be around, or if you know someone that you're with, talk to them and get them to pray with you and start your new life in Jesus. If you're out there on the internet today, you can make that decision as well. And for the saints that are here today, I pray that God's grace and peace would rest on you as you walk forward into the Passover season where we celebrate Easter and Good Friday coming up. That you would uh, remember all that we spoke of today and that it would just make it more meaningful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.